The core of Kant's deontological philosophy is the categorical imperative. This is how he summed up one's moral duties. Duties are determined purely by reason. And reason demands these duties must satisfy an all-encompassing principle, which is the categorical imperative. Now, it's imperative because it is necessary, and in Kant's view, you must obey it. It is categorical because it doesn't depend on any conditions and applies to everyone in every situation, with no exceptions. The first formulation of the categorical imperative is act only according to that maxim whereby you can, at the same time, will that it should become a universal law. In other words, actions must abide by a moral law, and moral law applies to all circumstances. Ideally, this means all people would act the same way with regard to morals. For example, if it's morally wrong for you to kill, then it's morally wrong for everyone else to kill. The imperative is also meant to be impartial. And actions are not guided by personal biases, but rather reason. Now Kant wanted something more universal that could be applied to everyone for every situation. Hypothetical imperatives fulfill specific goals. In other words, do X so that Y. Or if you want to stay out of jail, don't rob a bank. If you do want to go to jail, then this example wouldn't apply to me, but it would apply to me if I do not want to go to jail. This is what makes this example conditional. They only apply to specific circumstances. In contrast, the categorical imperative can be applied to everyone for every situation. Let's go back to the first formulation. It states that a moral code must transcend specific circumstances. This is also called universalizability. Moral principles must hold true for ourselves as well as others. Kant stated, always act in accordance with a maxim that you can, at the same time, will to be a universal principle. The first formulation also states that it is necessary and can be applied by rational beings. Now the second formulation of the categorical imperative is act in such a way that you treat humanity never merely as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end. This means don't do actions that treat people as a means to an end. Kant wants us to understand that people are the ends in themselves. People are not things. They actually have a moral value. You have a perfect duty not to use people as a means to an end. To use a person for your own ends would be to fail to respect that moral value. Also, treating someone like a thing would be to place more value on things than people. The third formulation of the categorical imperative is defined by Kant as the idea of the will of every rational being as a universal legislating will. In other words, a moral law cannot be universal unless all rational beings endorse it. Each being must will moral laws themselves. They must all legislate that morality themselves. In doing so, each being must ensure they don't violate the freedoms of others. Like the rest of deontology, the categorical imperative promotes moral duties and rules over consequences. It has some of the same strengths and weaknesses. One common criticism is the situation of lying to a murderer. Telling the truth is universally good, but what if a murderer asks you where his targets are? In this hypothetical, you can't refuse to answer. Even Kant said that you are morally obligated not to lie to the murderer. The fault here is that by following the categorical imperative, it may seem counterintuitive to what is good. The categorical imperative is the main component of Kant's deontology. It is well respected, but not without its issues.